So please welcome Bill. Thank you, Carlos. Yes, we're going to look at John chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, go ahead, open up. And we have a very interesting passage here where after Jesus performs a miracle in Jerusalem that uh, the religious leaders accuse him of making himself equal with God. And he call, because he called God his father, they say he's making himself equal with God. And the thrust of my presentation is going to be that that claim, the religious leadership's claim, was, they were not accusing Jesus of a equality of essence. Rather, it's to be understood in the Hebraic biblical mindset of this proverb, the one who is sent is equal to the one who sends him. There's a couple of different ways that that's expressed in Hebrew. Hashaliach shaveh l'sholcho. It's the word shaveh there. It's equal. I looked in the modern Hebrew translations of the Bible, and this is the way the translators put John 5:18. Translated it with the, this idea of being equal in the sense of in authority. The sender gives, grants his authority, his equal power of attorney authority to the one he sends. And the religious leaders in Jerusalem, this is what they're saying when Jesus calls God his Father. Let's just read the passage, the kind of the key uh, part of the, uh, John chapter 5. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now this has been a standard passage that Trinitarians have interpreted to show the deity of Jesus. According to the Trinitarian claim, the Judean leader's statement that Jesus made himself equal with God is to be understood that Jesus is co-equal and of the same substance as, as God, and therefore is God himself. It's often said that the Jewish leaders correctly interpreted Jesus calling God his Father as a claim to be God. The reason why Jesus couldn't be accused of, blasph of blasphemy was because he was God, or so the claim goes. Now actually, there's a bit of a scholarly disconnect you can, temp you can see that opinion in most of the popular presentations of this passage and in quite a few of the commentaries. But you can also see among the scholarly, scholarly world a, a certain hesitancy to ascribe these words saying Jesus is claiming to be God. So there is, in many passages, other passages, this is another one where there's a bit of a scholarly disconnect between what you hear in the from the uh, typical Trinitarian apologists and what the scholars are actually saying. My position is that neither Jesus calling God his own father, nor the Judeans' accusation against him of making himself equal with God, should be understood as a claim of deity, or that is an equality of essence with God. Rather, both Jesus' claim, that is, my father, and the Judeans' accusation should be understood in the light of the law of agency as an equality of representative authority encapsulated in the Hebraic proverb, the one sent is equal to his sender. The law of Jewish agency. The main point of the Jewish law of agency is expressed in the statement. A person's agent is regarded as the person himself. And later you can see the paper that there's a few uh, Mishnaic and Talmudic references. Let me quote one, a Rabbi Yonatan. This is from a Gomorrah in the Talmud. We have found, he says, we have found everywhere in the Torah that the legal status of a person's agent is as himself, as of himself. The agent is as of, he, he, he is representing. It's like the person that sent him is there. The agent's actions are the will of the sender and are legally binding. Therefore, any act committed 
by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal. Right? The principal is the one who sends the person. If an agent commits the act, it's as if the person that sent him, the principal, committed the act. In John 5, the Judean antagonists did not perceive Jesus calling God his own father as a claim to metaphysical deity, but as a claim to be God's human son, the Messiah, God's sent one, God's authorized chief representative. They understood Jesus correctly, I believe, to be claiming that the work that he did was really done by and for God the Father through him, through God's designated agent. But because of pride and jealousy, these Judeans refused to believe Jesus and the amazing, amazing accompanying evidence uh, that the healing was. Basing their refusal on grounds of an infraction against the Sabbath, these Judeans apparently did not understand why Jesus accomplished the John 5 miracle on the Sabbath. We'll see more later. I would suggest, and we'll come, I'll come to this slide a couple of times, that as we see in God, the Gospel of John chapter 9, the same book, the healing of a blind man, we have some of the Pharisees saying, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Same place, right? It's the other side of Jerusalem. They're going to use an infraction against their interpretation of the, of the Sabbath to say, this man, there's no accusation of being God here, this man is not from God because he breaks the Sabbath. I want to take a little excursus on what it means to be sent from a biblical perspective. We have to interpret the scriptures with the language and the context of the scriptures themselves. So from a biblical perspective, what does it mean to be sent? Biblical passages which describe sending humans are best understood in their Hebraic, yea, verily biblical context. That is, in the messenger or agency motif of the Old Testament, where the prophet is an emissary sent by Yahweh. Yes, angels were sent by God on occasion. The very name means a messenger. But neither the prophets nor Jesus were angels. The language and context for the human Jesus as sent by God is in the Bible. We don't have to go outside of the Bible to understand what it means to be sent by God. We note a few examples of biblical sending by God. And my guess is if I just ask this august group here, we would be able to come up with a number of good examples where people are sent by God. I've listed them for the sake of time, or some. Moses is a perfect example. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 and 15. God said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. Okay? Note also, during the rebellion of Korah, just before the ground was about to swallow up uh, the rebellious Korah and his family, Moses says, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. Sound a little familiar? Jesus is going to say that two times in this book, uh, this chapter. It's not of my own accord. The law of agency includes both words and deeds. To the Hebrew mind, words spoken by God's agent are God's words. Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like unto you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Another example, the prophets themselves. The prophets were sent by God. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 25. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, Yahweh is speaking, I have pers persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them. The prophets were sent by God. Day after day, Isaiah chapter 6, he sees a vision of Yahweh and a heavenly host accompanying him. Whom shall I send? Isaiah says, send me. He's the prophet who sent. John the Baptist, I'm going to go to the New Testament. The very book that we're going to look at here in chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John says as well, I myself do not know him, the Messiah, 
But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. For John the Baptist was sent by God. The law of agency, of sending. I want to pause here just for a second as we're within our own little excursus. This is rather a, a rather well-known illustration of the concept of agency in the New Testament. And that is the event right after the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus will heal the servant of a centurion, of a Roman centurion. If we compare Matthew's account with Luke's account, you can see here in this table, Jesus comes down and he entered Capernaum. A centurion came forward to him. Matthew says specifically that the centurion came personally to Jesus. When we look over at Luke, when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. How could this be? Because for the Jewish mind, to send that agent is as if you are there yourself. Okay, that's the law of agency. And then here, continuing on in the same account, Jesus said to him, I will come, he said to him, right, like he's speaking to the centurion, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Matthew is telling the whole account as if the centurion is right there present with Jesus. We look over at Luke, and it's actually the conversation is going on with agents, with messengers. Luke, Jesus went with them when he was not far from the house. The centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, I'm, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. So you can see here the law of Jewish, Jewish agency. Matthew has, is as if the centurion is present right there with Jesus. We know that he's actually communicating through agents because the agent fully represents the centurion. By the way, I think military personnel can understand this well. I've never been in the army, but I, I understand that, well, first of all, the chain of command is there. You, you, a colonel sends a lieutenant, and you're listening to that lieutenant as if the colonel is giving the order. And I think sometimes the lieutenant can actually sign for the colonel if the colonel gives him that authority. Jesus is sent by God. But Jesus was not sent, like the prophets, as a servant. He was sent as a son. The parable of the vineyard owner, Matthew chapter 21, verse 37 and following. The owner of the vineyard sends servants to collect part of the revenue. Finally, he sent his son, saying to them, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come let's kill him and have have his inheritance. The law of agency, even the law of double agency, is stated by Jesus in our Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. So there's actually a double agency in the Jewish literature as well, refers to double agency. So not only from the entire scripture, but specifically in the Gospel of John, we have the language and the context for what it means to be sent by God. Being sent by God involves a human being having a special commission from God, coming in the authority of God. Sending language is agency language. Now, although it's a little bit out of the topic of this study, the same also applies for language like coming from heaven or coming from God. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But we need to understand these phrases as well in the biblical, Hebraic mindset. Look, Jesus says, I came from God. Does that mean he had pre-existence? We can see from the Gospel of John that that's not what he means. You have a Jewish rabbi, John chapter 3 and verse 2, that comes and says this to Jesus, he calls Jesus a rabbi. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, the language of coming from God, it's right there in the book of John. We don't need to go somewhere else really to interpret what it means. Likewise, coming from heaven. It can mean the event or the word or the person on earth. Does it mean he descended or the event descended literally from heaven? What does Jesus say of John's baptism? Is it from heaven or from men? See, the Jewish metaphor is understood, it should be understood, in the context of the Hebraic mind, not in the context of a non-Hebraic mind. It's Jesus' opponents who don't understand those metaphors. 
Now, back to our event in John chapter 5. I want to make a couple comments about the chronological context of the Bethesda healing. John chapter 5, pools of Bethesda. By the time of the healing of the lame man at Bethesda, Jesus was already a well-known figure, both in Galilee and Judea. Jesus had cleansed the temple previous to this and gained a significant popular following of a multitude of disciples in Judea months before the Bethesda healing. I'll read from John chapter 2, right? Our chapter is John chapter 5. John chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. John chapter 4, also previous to the John 5 healing. Jesus is in Judea. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, John the Baptist, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. If Jesus had more disciples than John the Baptist, he has thousands of disciples. We have a record that corroborates in Josephus of the thousands of people that were following John the Baptist. I think this is important to understand, that Jesus already has a huge popular following when he's going to perform this miracle in John 5. So in John 5, after a period of ministry of Galilee, Jesus will come back to Judea for a Jewish festival. By this time, the Judean leadership and I believe Jews in the Gospel of John, says, Gospel of John says the Jews said this, the Jews said that. I believe that it's the Judean leadership. As a matter of fact, I think there's a big, big uh, theme in the Gospel of John, and actually in the Synoptics too, of the Galilean situation with, of Jesus and how they treat him, and the, his hometown, he's, he's a descendant of David from the tribe of Judah. His home is Judea. The Judeans, he came to his own. Those are Judeans. He came to his own. They did not receive him. But anybody who did receive him, in, in the majority of the cases, that's Galileans. And others, of course. Okay, so the Judeans are already against him for reasons of pride and jealousy. They were against Jesus, and they, des they desired to discredit him in the eyes of the multitude as a candidate for Messiah. The crux of the Judean leader's argument is this. He can't be God's Messiah. He can't be God's representative if he breaks the Sabbath. And that goes back to my parallel in John chapter 9 after another miracle of amazing features in uh, the city of Jerusalem. Some of the Pharisees, again, it's not all, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. You see, they're looking for a reason to discredit Jesus as Messiah or even as a prophet from God. That's what they're after. They're not claiming that he's God here. Now, another little excursus. The idea of the new creation in the Gospel of John. I think it's important to understand this, to understand the miracle. The new creation in the Gospel of John. There's a growing recognition, even among Trinitarian, traditional Christian commentators, that the Gospel of John presents Jesus as the Messiah through whom God inaugurates the new creation. As a recent blogger said, just Google the Gospel of John and the new creation, and you'll see all these articles where people are recognizing this. Okay? From the opening words of John's Gospel, the correlation of Jesus to the new creation is put forth. In the beginning, John boldly starts out as an echo of Genesis chapter 1. And the theme of new creation is, is a thread running through the Gospel of John from the beginning to the end, pardon the pun. In Jesus' prayer, the night before his crucifixion, he prays, John 17, 4, I have finished the work, okay? I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And Jesus' last words on the cross, it is finished, parallel, Genesis 2. On the seventh day, God finished his work which he had done. Now you can see the statements that parallel the book of Genesis in the completion of the work. Jesus says, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus, knowing that all was finished, John 19, 28. His last words on the cross in the book of John, it is finished, parallels the completion of the work of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. On the seventh day, God was finished. God finished his work. And people are recognizing this, and that the events and the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John are evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
through whom the regeneration of life to comes. It means the kingdom. The, the kingdom will come and you have regeneration of life. It is the Jesus of the Gospel of John who, after all, says, you must be born anew. That's, that's new creation language. The making whole or the making complete, the word is used five times in, the, in the John 5 of what Jesus did to this man. He made him whole. He made him complete. And in John chapter 7, verse 23, Jesus will refer to the miracle. He says, if on the Sabbath day I made a man's body whole, complete, you're after me. You oppose me. This is a sign that through Jesus, the rejuvenation of creation comes. The great hope of Israel expressed by the prophet Isaiah has come. Quoting Isaiah chapter 35. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. You see, the Jews are longing. Not only the Jews, so are we in the language of Paul. We are longing for the renewal of the creation. And that's what the Gospel of John is telling us. Jesus is the facilitator of that new creation. Now the Sabbath. Why does Jesus do the, these miracles on the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a sign of the completion of God's work and therefore a hope of the eventual restor restoration of all to wholeness. But the completion, the restoration, the new creation has not yet come. So in a certain sense, as Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 17, my father is yet working. Okay, My father is yet working. It's a statement that we're still waiting for the consummation of the regeneration. John chapter 5 verse 16 says, This was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. The verb tenses in John chapter 5 to 16 uh, express kind of a summary, a continuing situation. It's a continual aspect. It went on more than once. John 5 is one example of a continual state of affairs. This is the reason why they were doing it consistently, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. The, the, Jew, the Judean leaders used an interpreted infraction of the Sabbath to oppose Jesus. They missed the significance of Jesus' healing on the Sabbath. Jesus' performance of two Jerusalem miracles described in the Gospel of John, both done on the Sabbath, are signs that Jesus is the one through whom God establishes the new creation. Jesus is the one through whom wholeness, completeness, rest, in short, the new creation Sabbath comes. Get an amen? The Judean leadership either missed this impl implication or outright rejected it. I suspect maybe a little bit of both. All right, I want to just quickly look at John 5, 1 through 5. And in so doing, I want to talk about a geographical significance to the healing in the pools of Bethesda. In a sense, the Shabbat is a significance of time. Right? That he did these on the Shabbat is a sign that Jesus brings the completion of the, of the new creation. Okay? By the way, this is one of the reasons that the Jewish people today reject Jesus. He came, and we're still waiting. You know, where, where's the regathering of the Jewish people? Where's the lame jumping? Where's the healing? Where's the completion? It's not here. Right? This is one of the reasons that the Jewish people do. We'll get to that. John chapter 5. Now, there's a, there's a geographical significance to the healing at the pools of Bethesda. The location of the miracle also communicates that Jesus is the son of David, facilitator of the restored kingdom to come. The Gospels describe only two miracles of Jesus done in Jerusalem. Scratch your head and see if I'm right. Can you think of any other than the two miracles that Jesus did in Jerusalem? Pretty interesting. And they're both in the Gospel of John. The Synoptic Gospels don't describe any miracle of Jesus in Jerusalem. All the miracles, not one in Jerusalem that Matthew, Mark, or Luke could think of recording, only in the Gospel of John. Now, I'll put a little asterisk by that. For, uh, we'll get to the synoptics in a second again. So note the location of this miracle. Here's a picture of Jerusalem uh, from the northern side. Okay, The old city, it's only 450 uh, years old, this wall here. But most people recognize the Temple Mount in this area right here. On the northern side, the pools of Bethesda. Bethesda means the place of grace, the place of mercy, the place of covenant loyalty. It's a very fancy word, chesed, chesda in Aramaic. Okay, right here on the northern side of the Temple Mount. 
In John chapter 5, verse 1, we'll start out by saying, In Jerusalem there is a pool near the Sheep Gate. We think the Sheep Gate may have been a, one of the entrance gates into the temple from the north. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit more here. It's a bit dark, but you can see this kind of dark area right here, just to the northern side of the Temple Mount. There are pools that have been excavated. The remnants of them have been discovered. They're not small pools, they're huge. I'm, I estimated, just for, I didn't look it up, I should have probably, the size of the pools, I, I'm going to estimate just from what my mind kind of remembers, they're a, about 60 by 120 feet rectangular shape and probably about 30 feet deep. Okay, they're big. There are two of them separated by a dike or a wall here. Okay, and that's probably how we get the five porticos. One, two, three, four. Porticos are the colonnaded hallways, and the fifth one on the dike separating them. Probably the northern pool, this would be to the north, was earlier, by the way, this might be the pool, the upper pool, uh, mentioned in the book of Isaiah, where Ahaz goes, here's a prophecy from Isaiah, and later Hezekiah goes, and here's the threats by the Assyrian. That might be the upper pool. Could be, I tend to think it is, we're not really sure though. Now, then this one was built later, and some people think that there are sluice gates that the waters might stir because of the movement of water from one pool to another. And here's another little interesting feature. There was a temple to Asclepius at this location. The dating of it is difficult. Most people think, most archaeologists think it's from about 100 years after the time of Jesus, when Hadrian comes and takes over the city of Jerusalem. But there are some that think that already when the Romans come, see the Romans came to Jerusalem in 62 B.C., and they've got some garrisons on the north side of the temple area that they may have had a pool for Asclepius already in the time of Jesus. Okay? So in any case, if it's an, a, a belief that Asclepius is involved, he's the Roman god of healing. Or some kind of a Jewish mystic thing, you know, that, with these stirring of waters. Uh, that's, you've got the idea here where on the north side of the Temple Mount, you might get healing. Now, The second miracle of Jesus is on the south side of the city of Jerusalem. I have to get the button straight here. Okay, now we've turned around and we're looking at Jerusalem from the southern side. The pools of Bethesda are up here. Okay, we've come around to the other side of the city. Our last picture was like this. And now we're looking at the city from the south. The pool of Siloam, where Jesus will heal the blind man in John chapter 9, is on the southern side of the ancient Davidic city. You see this little spur of a hill right here? It comes south from the Temple Mount. That was the Jebusite city that was conquered by David, made into the city of David. And then Solomon will expand the city to include the Temple Mount. Now see what's going on here? See where I'm leading? The geographical location of the miracles of Jesus in Jerusalem are telling us something. And that is that he's the Son of God, like Solomon. Okay, let me explain a little bit what I mean. Here's a Google Earth shot of Jerusalem. That's the city of David. And then Solomon expands the city to include the Temple Mount. The location of Bethesda is where the blue is right here. Those are the two Bethesda pools. The location of the pool is Siloam, where Jesus heals the blind man. John chapter 9 is right there, okay, in the southern part. So you've got the north and the southern extremities of the Solomonic city. And Jesus comes and heals a blind and a lame man in those locations. Okay? This is, I think, somewhat of a, a statement. Now, I said that there's no miracle described in the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus heals, a blind, uh, heals in Jerusalem or performs a miracle in Jerusalem. That's not really correct. There's one. The very last week of, the, of Jesus' life. He comes to the Temple Mount. Only days he'll be crucified. He cleanses the Temple a second time. And Matthew, one verse, Matthew 21, 14 says, And the lame and the blind came to him on the temple mount, and he heals them. All right? This is, they're telling us something here. The Gospel of John, the synoptics are telling us what? That this is the one who brings in the kingdom. This is the Solomonic city. Okay, Solomon is the son of David, who's called the son of God in the scriptures. And Jesus is making a claim here to be that son of David, who will usher in the restored kingdom of Solomon on the Temple Mount where the king and God resided. Two different people. All right, now let's get back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 1. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and open up. After this, there was a festival of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The, after this, again, I think 
I want to emphasize that Jesus had already been ministering in Galilee. He interrupted his Galilean ministry. He's already known. He's already a popular figure. And the Judean leadership is looking for ways to discredit him in the eyes of the multitude. There's a festival of the Jews. This is curious that John doesn't name which festival this is. I tend to think it's a spring festival, probably uh, Shavuot, but there's no way we know. That's Pentecost. But the fact that John doesn't say which festival this is, when he does specifically mention all the other festivals, two times he mentions Passover, John chapter 7 he mentions Tabernacles, and in John chapter 10 he mentions Hanukkah, and he doesn't mention which festival here, suggests that John wants us to see in Jesus a general fulfillment of all the expectations that the biblical festivals like the Sabbath rest in, uh, represent. The festivals are reminders of how God worked in the past, but also look forward to the eschatological renewed kingdom on earth. That Jesus does this on a Shabbat in a Jewish festival is telling us, here comes. Here's the regeneration. John 5.3 says, In these pools lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. This is a reminder of the human condition, yet a longing for restoration. All creation, as Paul says, groans for completeness to come. The proximity of these to be pitied people to the Temple Mount shows the powerlessness of the priestly religious Jewish leadership to do anything about the situation. In contrast to the Jewish Jerusalem establishment, the power of God was with Jesus to heal. Remember those pools of Bethesda? They're so close. They, the religious leadership couldn't do anything. And here comes Jesus. The power of God was with him to heal. It's remarkable that the religious authorities care little about the man that, that he had been healed, that he'd been made whole, in a real sense that the man had been given life. Their concern is to discredit Jesus with an infraction against their tradition. The com they completely miss or ignore the sign and its grandeur. I think no evidence is going to convince them. They, they miss the, the purpose. Their mindset is evident again when the blind man was given sight in John 9, and all they cared to prove is, this man is a sinner. He can't be from God because he breaks the Sabbath. The manuscript evidence of John chapter 4 is probably, uh, it, it shows us that it's not, John uh, 5 verse 4 is not in the original text, which is the text which just says that an angel of the Lord would come down occasionally and stir the waters. Uh, it also goes against, it's very interesting in the, in the Gospel of John, the word Lord is used only of Jesus, or it's or the other way to say it, it's used of God Almighty only when there's a quote from the Old Testament, Lord. Otherwise, Lord in the Gospel of John is always of Jesus. Right? So in that text, which I think is in a later edition, it says an angel of the Lord came down. That would be the only time the word Lord, outside of a quote from the Old Testament, uh, is used for God. So I think it's uh, incorrect it, later insertion. Okay, there's more to say of the leading up to the miracle, but now I want to come to chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Again, the Trinitarian claim is... When Jesus called God my Father, that in the, and the Jewish religious authority statement that he made himself equal with God, they, the claim is that this shows that Jesus claimed to be God. As a matter of fact, in the Bible I'm holding here, the heading in John chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse uh, 17, Jesus claims to be God. Yeah, that, that's what it says right there in the heading. Okay? That's the typical term, uh, claim. Now, by the way, it's in, I think this is in some ways a test case. If that is wrong, then maybe the other typical interpretations of passages in John, like John 8, 38, I, uh, before Abraham was, I am, or John 10, 30, I and the Father are one, or Thomas' statement in chapter 20, my Lord and my God. Perhaps if this interpretation is wrong, maybe there's a crumbling of the other interpretations in the rest of the Gospel of John as well. And I think that's the case. I think that's what we're going to see here, that this is the incorrect interpretation. I believe this is an inter incorrect interpretation for three reasons. Number one, the meaning of the word, the Greek word that is translated equal in this passage. 
Asan, my Greek uh, pronunciation I'm sure is wrong. This is an issue. The word is used only eight times in the New Testament. In Matthew 20, 12, the varying vineyard laborers were given equal pay. Luke 6, 34 describes an equal amount of pay as well. In Acts 11, 17, Peter says they received the equal gift, the gift of the Spirit that we read, receive, both Jews and Gentiles. Revelation 21, 16, the sides of the New Jerusalem are of equal length, equivalent, as Keenan just mentioned. Okay, there, in each case, there are two distinct objects that are involved. They're not essentially the same, but there's a certain equivalence. Perhaps the most clarifying use of the word is in Mark 14, verse 56 and 59, where a better understanding of this word would be consistent or in agreement. The false witnesses that, that came before Jesus, their testimony was not equal. What does it mean? It wasn't consistent. The one witness over here, his testimony differed from this one over here. It wasn't consistent. Their testimony was not in agreement. It makes better sense to understand the equality of the Father and the Son here as an equality contained in the law of agency, where the one sent is equal. That is, he's consistent. He's in agreement. He's of the, and of the same legal authority. He's equal in legal authority to the one who sent him. Interesting, this is word is the one that is used by Paul in Philippians 2, 6 that Jesus did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. It's likely, I believe it's so, that Paul means the equality not of essence, but of granted legal authority that Jesus is given as the divinely commissioned representative of God. It's that equality that Jesus did not hang on to. And by the way, I think he doesn't even hang on to it now, if Jesus is asked to give up that authority, he would. Second point, the second reason why the, ter the traditional Trinitarian interpretation is wrong. Calling God my Father is not a claim to deity. Okay? I don't know how, it cannot be overemphasized. Okay? To the Hebraic biblical mind, calling God my Father is not a claim to deity. To repeat is to emphasize. That God is called humankind's father is an essential feature of the Bible. Based on Old Testament revelation, the Jewish people are called the firstborn son. Exodus 4.22, Hosea 11.1. 1. Isaiah states clearly, you, Yahweh, are our father. Ata Adonai Avinu, Ata Jehovah Avinu, you are our father. This is a biblical mind, okay? The fatherhood of God is likewise consistently expressed in the New Testament. Jesus speaks of your Father who is in heaven and instructs his disciples to pray our Father in heaven. Near the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus declares, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. To the biblical mind, the fatherhood of God is metaphorical, representing God's role as the giver of life, okay, like a father the giver of life, and all that's encapsulated in the father-child relationship. Intimacy, concern, discipline, care, representation, and not the least of which, inheritance. The son inherits the father's property. In comparison to the Hellenist or Greek mind, the fatherhood of God is metaphysical. To the Jewish mind, metaphorical. To the Hellenist mind, metaphysical. Having to do with substance and essence. For instance, Dionysus, since he's the son of Zeus, is, of, is divine in essence. He was the god of merrymaking and wine. It was, the Hellenist, it was in this Hellenistic way that the church fathers of later centuries incorrectly interpreted the fatherhood of God in relation to Jesus. You see, in the Bible, God is father. That's very important. To mankind, he relates to us as a father. For the, for the Hellenist mind and for the Trinitarian, when the Bible says God the Father, it's used to distinguish a relationship within the Trinity itself. In their mind, because I was one, in my mind, God the Father meant, well, that means he's not God the Son. It's a distinguishing of the relationship of the deity, of the Godhead and the deity. It's not the Bible. The fatherhood of God in the Bible is God and humankind. There's no hypothetical a relationship of one God to another or one person to another of a Godhead. 
Now, many commentators have noticed a somewhat rare singular personal pronoun in Jesus' words, my father. Jews refer to God collectively as our father. It's a beautiful prayer. Avinu Malkeinu, right? Our father, our king. So they use the word our a lot, but rarely with the singular pronoun, my father. But is Jesus' use of the singular pronoun a reason for us to jump over into the Hellenistic realm of father-son relationship of essence? Is that a reason to do that? The answer is clearly no. Because there is a Hebrew, biblical-minded precedent for calling God my father. If you know your Bible, it means something when somebody says my father. To, to call God my father. In the Hebraic biblical world, it's not a claim to deity, and the Judean listeners knew this. Rather, calling God my Father is a claim to be Messiah, based on scriptures. God promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, 14, that David's descendants will be my son, I will be his father. In Psalm 2, 7, Yahweh says to the Messiah, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. In Psalm 89, 26, the Davidic king will call to Yahweh saying, You are my father, my God. Okay? So this is the Messiah. This is Messianic language. Jews knew, or they should have known, that the Messiah would call God my father. As the Messianic son, Jesus his my father statement is a claim to represent the father, of being vested with the father's authority. The antagonistic listener's claim is not, he claims to be God, blasphemy. Not to be overly disparaging, but that is an interpretation of John 5 that a Gentile Hellenist would come up with. Being predisposed to interpret biblical language through a Hellenistic lens or ignorant of what the fatherhood of God means in the Bible. Rather, the Judeans claim is he can't be Messiah who will call God my father. He can't be God's agent son, equal to the sending father in a legal authority because he breaks the Sabbath. Yeah, they're using this to tell people, uh-uh, this guy can't be, can't be prophet, can't be representing God. The Judean leaders want to discredit Jesus in the eyes of the multitude. They, they believe they have an excuse to reject Jesus' messianic claim. Someone who is God's agent wouldn't do things that God himself wouldn't do. The Messiah wouldn't do things that God didn't commission him to do. The Messiah wouldn't break the Sabbath. He can't be Messiah. The Judean leaders view summed up in that statement that I've already quoted from John chapter 9, verse 16. This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. That's their claim. They're not saying he is God. They're saying he's not from God. He can't be Messiah because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. We know this man is a sinner. The question is, is Jesus the Messiah? The question is not, is Jesus God? The Judeans had already agreed that if anyone, read this in John chapter 9, verse 22, if you've got it, if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. So there's no idea of him claiming to be God here. Now we might pause to ask, was Jesus breaking the Sabbath? I believe the answer is yes and no. Yes, Jesus broke the Sabbath as this particular group of Judeans had defined it. We're not going to go into all the legal definitions of healing or not on the Sabbath. By the way, Jesus healed only here by, by, just only by speaking. Or how heavy a burden was allowed on the Sabbath. But the religious leadership used Jesus' attitude to their traditional interpretation of Sabbath against him. On the other hand, no, Jesus did not break the Sabbath. Because he kept it in the way the Father intended. The Sabbath accusation is a question of authoritative tradition. Whose definition of keeping Sabbath is correct? The religious leadership, or by the way, that segment of the religious leadership, because all you gotta go, all you gotta do is go down the block and you're gonna find another interpretation of what's right to keep the Sabbath. So which one is right? Is it theirs, represented by that temple, or this particular member? It's some of the Pharisees said, or is it Jesus? As mentioned above, the religious leaders missed the reason Jesus did these restoration deeds on the Sabbath. The miraculous making complete on the Sabbath showed Jesus to be the agent of the new creation restoration. 
Now we also know that contrary to the Judean leader's accusation in John 5.18, Jesus did not make himself equal to God. Jesus did not make himself the messenger. He didn't volunteer. Okay? And that also opposes Trinitarianism. He didn't make himself equal in legal status to God. Rather, God commissioned Jesus with the authority. And Jesus did not shirk from the responsibility. The third reason that the traditional, traditional Trinitarian interpretation of John 5.18 is wrong. Remember, with meaning of the word equal, okay, what does that, does that really mean equal in essence? To call God your father, does that mean uh, that you're God? The third reason is the context of John chapter 5, which my friend John already pointed out last night. He knew this right away. It's all about agency. There's no metaphysical equivalence. Right? A claim to be God in John chapter 5. Let's just look at a few verses now in the rest of John chapter 5 to see this is agency. It's agency language through and through. Okay? The next verse, John 5, 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son is not able to do anything of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. This is agency language. You don't have power or authority to do anything unless you're given that authority by the principal, by the sender, okay? And also the verb here of what he sees, what the son sees the father doing, it's a present act of meaning Jesus continues to do so. It's not something that Jesus did in a past pre-existent state. It's, what, it's, it's an ongoing uh, relationship with the father. By the way, compare Moses' words where he says, I don't do this on my authority. You're gonna know by what happens. Chapter five, verse 22, I'm just gonna skim through here. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. The agent is granted authority by the principle that Jesus of the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of John, the Gospel that most Trinitarians want to go to for the deity of Jesus, especially the Gospel of John, makes clear over and over and over again that Jesus' authority has been granted to him, given to him. Such statements make no sense if a divine coexistent, co-eternal member of a Godhead is meant. But they make perfect sense in the agency uh, atmosphere. 523, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This verse, it's another one used by Trinitarians, to claim Jesus' deity. Jesus gets the same honor as the Father, so he must be God. But Jesus' statement is in the context of the law of agency. See the rest of it? If you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. Who sent Him? It's agency language. Okay? To honor the messenger is to honor the one who sent Him. The double honor. Honor the Son, honor the Father. The double honor here is not because Jesus is of the same essence as God, but because Jesus represents God. Not to honor the messenger is to dishonor the one who sent him. That's what this passage means. It doesn't mean that Jesus is equivalent metaphysically with God. It means he's equivalent to God because he's God's representative agent. Like Jesus says in this book, John chapter 13, verse 20, whoever receives me, excuse me, whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. John 5, 24, next. Truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes, him who sent me has eternal life. Some 40 times in the Gospel of John, it's stated by Jesus, or claimed by the writer of the Gospel, that Jesus was sent. That's agency. Now, in chapter 5, verse 25 to 27, Jesus says, the hour is coming, and now is. And then he tells two more authorities that have been granted to him by God Almighty the Father. Jesus claims two specific authorities or abilities granted him by the Father. The Father granted, that's agency language, the Son to have life in himself. And the Father has given him authority to execute judgment. This is agency language, to grant authority, to give authority. Okay? Compare 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For as by a man came death, also by a man comes the resurrection of the dead. See, God has granted to the human Jesus the authority to give life. Because the Father loves the Son, Jesus also has the authority from the Father to judge. 
compare Acts 17, verse 3. He, that's God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. This is agency language. Now we should ponder in awe that God has granted such authority to man. Indeed, to a man. That phrase in John chapter 5, verse 25, and now is, the hour is coming, and now is. This is the language of already and not yet. Jesus' deeds, like raising the dead or healing this lame man, are evidences, they're tastes, they're a little sample that the kingdom's inauguration has begun. And that through him, it's coming through him, but it waits completion. And now is. The hour is coming. It's waiting completion. And now is. We get a little taste with Jesus. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 30. He says, I do nothing on my own authority. This is the second time in 11 verses that Jesus says this. Are we listening to him? If not, why not? And the Trinitarian take on, this, uh, on a verse like this is that in some way, one person of a multi-personal Godhead doesn't act independently of another. Besides being strange speculation, such a suggestion is blind to the agency being presented in John's entire gospel in chapter 5, and yea, verily, in this same verse. Okay? He says, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, this is agency language. <clears throat> The agent does not speak or act on his own authority, but on the authority of the one who sent him. These words can be understood plainly, knowing that Jesus is the sent agent of Yahweh. There's no need for speculations about interactions of divine co-equal persons. John chapter 5, verse 31. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. The agent, with the power of attorney. See, Americans, we can understand this because we have the idea of a power of attorney, comes with witnesses or witness, evidence that he's been granted the authority by the one that sent him. Okay? I recently bought a house in Tennessee with my father. Right? Now, my father was in California. I couldn't just go to the loan people and say, my father gave me authority to, to use his bank account. I couldn't do that just on my own testimony. They're not going to believe me. Okay? So what do we do? He goes and gets a paper signed by a notary, a witness, and that paper is my authority that I am vested to act in my father's stead. Okay? I have full authority to use his bank account to sign for that loan. Okay? Even so, Jesus had evidence of his authority from the father. The first one Jesus mentioned, he mentions a few here, is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' notary. Okay? 536, the works that the Father has given me, here's another testimony authority, that Jesus has authority from the Father. The works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I'm doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Okay, it's agency language. The works Jesus did bore witness that the Father sent him. The works were not a witness that Jesus is God, but or that he was sent from some pre-existent state. Rather, Jesus' works were like the works of Moses and the prophets, yet in a grander way. The Israelites said, never have we seen something like this in Israel. Grander than Moses. These works, they bore witness that God sent him. Jesus healing the lame and the blind was evidence that God sent him as his agent par excellence. There's no prophet that healed uh, the blind. I don't think there's one that raised the lame, is there? Think about that one for a second. Is there any prophet that uh, healed the lame? I think the lame and the blind were reserved for evidence. This is the kingdom. Right? The scriptures bear witness, 539 and 45, including Moses. They bear witness that the Father sent Jesus. Not 541. Jesus says, I do not receive glory from men. We need to think about that one. All of us right here. I do not receive glory from men. Why? Because he's doing the job of a faithful messenger. Right? He's been sent by God the Father. That's his job. He only seeks to do the will of the one who sent him. He doesn't deviate from the sender's will. John 5, 43, I've come in my Father's name. That's my Father's authority. That's agency language. 
and you do not receive me. John 5, 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? I think a major reason people don't believe who Jesus is is because they value the honor of humans above the honor that comes from, as Jesus says, the only God. And the only God for Jesus is Yahweh, the God of Israel. To sum up our third reason that the Trinitarian interpretation of John 5.18 is incorrect, that an equality of divine essence is not what John 5.18 is all about. Jesus' discourse following the Judean leadership claim that he makes himself equal to God, it's all agency language. The equality is that of a granted legal authority, not an equality of essence. Once agency and its language are understood, it's unnecessary to postulate Hellenistic concepts like equality of essence. Folks, I taught Bible for 30 some years. I didn't know what agency was. It was blind. I didn't, nobody ever really talked about it. I probably ran into it somewhere in a commentary. But we don't, we don't, once we understand it, it falls into place. John snaps into focus. I really think so. So if I have just a few minutes, I want to review my whole presentation. I know it's been a lot. To review, Jesus healed a lame man at the pools of Bethesda near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This is a real place on our earth. Uncovered in archaeological excavations, at least partially, Jesus' healing of the lame and the blind are works that God did through Jesus, compare Acts 2.22, and serve as testimony to the identity of the Messiah. The location of the miracles on the borders of the Solomonic city of Jerusalem show that Jesus is the promised Davidic king through whom the promised kingdom restoration comes. The timing of the miracles during a festival on the Sabbath are a taste, and now is, that Jesus is the messianic agent of the new creation through whom all things are made known, through whom we, too, will feel and experience completeness. That's why it's on Shabbat. And the next point is that Jesus is God's human messenger or agent par excellence. Agency is the prominent theme in John chapter 5 and all of the Gospel of John. Once we can understand that the one sent is equivalent, is equal to the sender, then I think we can understand the words of Jesus better. My father is not a claim to deity. It's a messianic claim. The religious leadership wants to discredit Jesus' potential of being a Messiah by saying he can't be because he breaks the Sabbath. And then, an encouragement, maybe a bit of a challenge. We are Jesus ambassadors or messengers. God's ambassadors through Jesus. Jesus prayed in our gospel, John chapter 17, verse 18. He says to the Father, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So we become ambassadors. We become representative agents now. John 13, 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send, receives me. And whoever receives me, the one who sent me. You can see the reverse of that. If they don't receive you, they're, they're not receiving me, and they don't receive the one who sent me. Paul concurs in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Messiah. See, the ambassador is an agent. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to God. Like Jesus, we don't speak or act on our own authority. We don't seek our own will. We don't seek glory from men, but from the only God. Finally, there's great reward for being a faithful messenger. You can see the messenger language in the book of Revelation. When we see authority being granted, this is agency language. The red doesn't come out so well here. Look at what the Jesus says about those who conquer. The one who conquers, who keeps my works until the end. To him, I will give authority. That's agency language. Over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father. You see, that's agency. Thank you.